Hey everybody and welcome back to my channel and Happy New Year. I hope you had a lovely Christmas and a good New Year and I hope that 2020 is a happy and prosperous and comfortable year for you. I've got a few exciting things planned this year already but I'm sure the calendar will throw up lots of surprises as we go along. But I need to finish off 2019 of course with my December favourites, particularly looking at Christmas stuff but there's one or two other things in there as well. So there's some stuff I did and I saw while I was out and about. There's some lovely food that I had and there's also various bits of entertainment of course as well which is going to take up the majority of the video. So there's quite a lot to cover. Um, I've done three blog posts to go with this rather than just one like I usually do. So they'll all be linked to the description along with all the other usual links. Nothing in this is sponsored or gifted. These are all my own opinions. Everything I bought, I bought with my own money. I just thought I'd share with you the things that I got up to and the things that I enjoyed as per usual. So I will crack straight on with it and I hope you enjoy. So we'll start with the things that I got up to when I was out and about as per usual and the first couple of items aren't festive in nature because they're museum visits so I thought I'd get them out of the way first. So the first thing to mention is that I went on an audio described tour of the Troy Myth and Reality exhibition at the British Museum which is really interesting and it made for a nice follow on to the Parthenon course that I did in November because this was another piece of ancient Greek history of course. So I knew the basics of the Troy story, like things to do with the Trojan horse and stuff like that, but I didn't really know it in much detail, so it was great to hear about it being described by Lonnie Evans, and also getting a lot of context from one of the curators of the exhibition as well. So we got a lot of detail there, really, really interesting. There's a lot of very interesting exhibits there, like statues and artworks and various other bits and pieces. And that exhibition is open until the 8th of March, so you've still got time to go and have a look if you wish. And there may be another audio described tour in February, because the one in January that was following on from December was sold out. So keep an eye out in case you're interested in that. And then my friend Claire and I went to the Welcome Collection to see their Play Well exhibition, which is all about the importance of play. For children in particular, but also for society at large too. And it was illustrated by photos and artworks of children playing and a selection of toys and games as well. There wasn't a huge selection of um, games there. There weren't things like board games and card games, for instance, but there were things like dolls and Lego and stuff like that, and a few digital games too at the end. So it's quite a nice selection of things they had there. And the main message really was the fact that children aren't playing outdoors as much as they used to, you know, which is leading to problems like obesity and poor self-confidence and mental health issues, etc. as they grow up. And children aren't doing this because... They're addicted to screens partly on their phones and tablets and computers and so on. But there's also the fact that there's a lot of urbanisation destroying parkland. You know, there's buildings replacing where parks used to be, all these skyscrapers going up everywhere. There's overly protective parents who wrap their children up in cotton wool a bit too much and general health and safety fears. So, you know, all these various factors are kind of restricting children playing outside as much as they used to, which is a great shame. You know, I used to enjoy playing outside as a kid. And obviously when I was young, we didn't have smartphones and computers anyway. And it was nice to see a selection of dolls with disabilities there as well at one point. You know, not all children want to play with disabled toys necessarily, but some disabled children will feel very reassured and empowered by having toys that they feel they can relate to and who represent them. So it is important to have them in the market for them to be able to play with and interact with. And this exhibition also closes on the 8th of March, like the Troy exhibition, funnily enough. So you can go and check it out until then if you wish. And there's also an audio described tour coming up on Thursday, the 23rd of January at 6 p.m., um, which you may just have time to book onto by the time this video goes out, but I would get in there quick if you're going to do that. But it is well worth looking around. You know, it's not quite as comprehensive as I might have expected or wanted, perhaps, but it's still pretty good. So it's well worth a look. And then I went to see a few festive lights and displays, of course, too. I didn't get out quite as much as I wanted to over Christmas because I had a bit of a cold over Christmas week itself. But certainly in the run-up to Christmas, I went out to a few places. So I went up to Oxford Street, of course, because they had nice lights up there, as they usually do. And I had a look at the John Lewis display with their Edgar character, Excitable Edgar, the dragon, from their adverts. And, of course, credit has to be given to John Lewis and partners for their Christmas advert this year. Not just because it was nice and sweet and everything, but because they also produced an audio described version of it, which was really good of them. One or two other retailers did as well, but John Lewis are obviously the big guns when it comes to Christmas adverts. So the fact that they were doing it sets a good example for everyone else. And also the Flannels store, um, which I've never been into in Oxford Street, I've never heard of it before, but they had a cool kind of animated montage of photos by David Bailey, a very well-known photographer, on the large screens on the front and side of their building. So you had famous faces like Mother Teresa and Nelson Mandela, David Beckham, the rock band Queen, and so on and so forth. So that was really cool to look at. I kind of got a nice long video of that that I've posted. And I also had a lovely day attending the Christmas shopping event in Chelsea as well because lots of shops were offering discounts and treats that day. Although the stalls themselves didn't really interest me so I didn't bother looking at those. But they did have lots of decorations and lights up um, which were really nice to look at and have a little wander around. And there was also lots of nice music being played as well. So there was a very nice group of Chelsea pensioners who were singing Christmas songs which was really lovely. 
And there was also a very catchy set from a trio of ladies called Satin Dolls. So I enjoyed watching both of those, and there was quite a big crowd there in both cases. And there was also a small Salvation Army band as well, which was nice to see. And at the end of that day, I had a wander up nearby to Harrods, because obviously their buildings always lit up every Christmas. It always looks amazing. I had a look at their Christmas window displays as well. So that was really nice. It made for a nice uh, afternoon out. And then I also had a little walk around Barking as well, because that's fairly near where I live. So, you know, there wasn't as much to see there as in central London, but they had some nice decorations in their Vicarage Field shopping centre, so that was nice to look at. And then I also went down to Devon for a fleeting visit for a couple of nights as well. I stopped off in Exeter and saw their Christmas lights in the high street after I'd met a friend in the city there. So that was really nice to see the lights there, and it was great to meet an old school friend of mine and have a catch-up with her, so that was good. And so that brings me on to the food I enjoyed over the Christmas period because I enjoyed various festive treats over Christmas, as you can imagine. So while I was down in Devon, I had a lovely meal with my work colleagues at the Bistro Pierre in Torquay. And the staff of the Torquay Premier Inn were lovely too, as always. And I also came home with a couple of prizes from the work raffle too, a bottle of McGuigan's Black Label Chardonnay, which Mum and I had with our Christmas dinners on Christmas Day and Boxing Day, which was lovely. And a box of Fox's Fabulously Collection Chocolate Biscuits. So we were very happy with those. And also had a nice uh, Christmas meal when I was back in London with the visually impaired people of Newham Group as well, a pub in Manor Park. So it was nice to catch up with those guys again. But at home, of course, we had lots of treats over Christmas. So in the lead up to Christmas, I had a Lint Milk Chocolate Truffles Advent Calendar, which was lovely because Lint Chocolate is always nice. The numbers were a bit hard to find and to read, but the lovely smooth chunky chocolates that are in there really made up for that. They were worth finding. And then for our main Christmas dinner, we went to Marks and Spencer's, as has been traditional over the last couple of years now. We used their food to order service, so we order it online and then pick it up in store. So we got one of their free range turkey crowns with pork, chestnut, bacon and thyme stuffing. It had layers of bacon across it as well. And we also got some of their stuffing balls and pigs in blankets as well and some turkey gravy. We didn't need the stuffing balls with the Christmas dinner itself because there was stuffing already in the turkey crown, so we saved them for later meals. But we did have pigs in blankets, of course, because you have to, and the turkey gravy was lovely. We also got their beef wellington, but that didn't work out quite as well because it was cracked across the top of the pastry when we got it. Which, to be fair, the member of staff at the checkout did alert us to, and he said, you know, they didn't have another beef wellington they could give us. There wasn't any other product like it that they could exchange it for. So we were offered a bottle of champagne or a discount to compensate for it. And we're not huge fans of champagne. I mean, I don't mind it, but mum's not a huge fan. So we went for a discount. So we basically ended up paying half price for it, which was really good, actually. And, you know, it was nice when we ate it. We cooked it all right and we used to let it. You know, it's basically this huge joint of beef wrapped up in pastry. It's not something we'd buy again necessarily, but it was still nice. It was still uh, worth a go. And then we also went for some of their treats and desserts, of course. How could we not? So we got their sticky toffee pudding trifle, their Christmas rainbow cake, which was layers of different coloured sponge with buttercream between them, and a woodland yule log, which is basically this chocolate log with woodland-type decorations on the top, like leaves and toadstool and things. And they were all lovely, but the best by far out of that lot was the woodland yule log. It was just so chocolatey without being too rich, so it just really tasted good. And then earlier in the month, I'd also been to m and and got another of their chocolate yule logs, as it happens. Just a plain yule log this time, not a decorative one like we got for Christmas. But again, that was really chocolatey, really nice. So yule logs seem to have been their specialty this year. And we also got some of their mince pies, of course, as you can imagine. And we got a big selection tub of their chocolates too, which is a bit like, you know, Roses or Quality Street, that kind of selection. So that was really nice. But we also went to Sainsbury's as well, because that's where we do our regular grocery shopping. So they had plenty of Christmas treats too. We always get their pack of four puff pastry mince pies from the bakery area. They're very nice, warm or cold. We also got their regular kind of deep-filled mince pies, the boxes of six as well. We also got some stuffing balls and pigs in blankets from them as well. So we had them in the lead up to Christmas. And for desserts, we enjoyed their ultimate chocolate ice cream log. And we got Santa's raspberry belly cheesecake. Lovely raspberry flavour to it, lovely strong flavour. So that was really nice. And then our new discovery this year was Walker's Shortbread, who are based in Scotland. And this is a completely different company to the other Walkers who make the crisps. A friend of mine had told me that they had enjoyed Walker's mince pies. So we thought we'd have a look at their website and see what we fancied. And we got quite a few bits and pieces from them to try out. So we got a pack of the luxury mince pies. We got a rich fruit Christmas pudding, a chocolate shortbread selection box, and packs of biscuits like ginger royals, all butter sultana biscuits, and treacle toffee biscuits. And as we'd spent over a certain amount, they threw in a salted caramel fruit pudding as well. It was all very, very nice. We were very pleased with all that. So that also kept us going very nicely over the Christmas period. And so finally, we come to the entertainment I enjoyed during December and particularly over the festive period, of course, 
There's a lot of this, so I'm not going to go into huge detail. You can see much more information about these things in my blog post. And the first thing I mentioned, though, is something that I was in, which was another podcast, um, just to conclude my 50 minutes of fame for 2019. I did quite well last year. Disability charity Leonard Cheshire have relaunched their podcast under the new name of the Disability Download, and they've taken the opportunity to re-release some of their older interviews from the year. So they've re-released my interview that I did about the assistive technology that I use. And there are various other people featured in that as well. So go and give that a listen and go and subscribe to it. I'll put the link in the description to this uh, video, of course. But then moving on to things that I wasn't in, and we'll start with sitcoms. And the most significant new one was The Goes Wrong Show, which is by the people of Mischief Theatre. They're well known for their brilliant stage shows like the comedy about a bank robbery that I saw a couple of years ago. And they've also had Christmas specials on TV in the past too with A Christmas Carol Goes Wrong and Peter Pan Goes Wrong. So now they've got a full series, which is great. And basically each week, this fictional amateur dramatics company puts on a play on a different topic and basically everything goes wrong as they try and perform it. It's a big farce, basically, and as things go wrong, they have repercussions later on. So there's always multiple payoffs for each gag as things fall apart for them. So... It's quite good fun because it's very difficult to deliberately get things wrong in that way because you know, of all the writing and the choreography and the timing that's involved with it to make it work in a comedic sense. It's actually very, very cleverly done. So that's very impressive and I'm looking forward to the rest of the series. Not Going Out also had a special where Lee and Lucy were heading out to try and get the last inflatable Santa Claus for their children, but Lucy's wallet and phone were stolen, so Lee and Lucy end up on this journey trying to get it back and then trying to get home again. The rest of the family and their relatives did have stuff to do back at the house, but it was mainly about Lee and Lucy, and then the family had the big payoff at the end. So yeah, it was a nice episode. Again, it was something a bit different for them. It was nice and fun, so I enjoyed that. Gold repeated the Christmas specials of 2.4 Children because they've been showing the rest of the episodes during the year, but they had been holding back some of the Christmas ones. So it's great to see them because there was a couple I hadn't seen for a long time. You know, I have got series one to three on DVD, but otherwise beyond that, I hadn't seen the others for a long, long time. So it's great to see those because they often do musical numbers at the end and they're just great fun, their festive specials. And that was good. But I did see a few other classic sitcom specials as well for Christmas, as I always do every year. You know, there's a few classics you always dig out, like Porridge and Falls Norses and that kind of thing. So, you know, I did indulge in the classics as usual. And then my big DVD purchase of the month was season 19 of The Simpsons, which we didn't think we'd get because they kind of stopped releasing the DVDs and they were trying to push people to kind of stream or download them instead. But after a lot of fan demand, they have released season 19. It's a good series, you know, there's some nice episodes in there. You've got audio commentaries as an extra feature too as always there isn't really anything else to write home about in terms of extras there's an introduction from Matt Groening and a very very brief thank you message but that's it so it's only the audio commentaries that are notable extra on there but it's the episodes that you buy it for so I was glad to get those I also saw Family Guy as well because they had the Christmas episode from season 18 called Christmas is Coming on ITV2, so that was good. And I also bought the DVD of season 19, which actually contains the episodes from TV season 17 because their DVD numbering is two seasons out of step now with the TV series, which is confusing for people, but it's just the way they numbered their earlier seasons. It pushed everything else back a couple. So it doesn't really matter as long as I've got the episodes. That's all that counts, basically. But I haven't watched that DVD yet. I'm going to watch that in January. So I'm not going to do a review of that DVD until I've watched it. And we also had Still Open All Hours as well on over December, which finished with a very sweet Christmas special with a very nice surprise at the end of it. So yeah, I will be getting the DVD of that, which has now come out this month. And then moving on to topical comedy, there were various review shows looking back at the year, as you would expect. Charlie Brooker doesn't do his wipe shows anymore, which is a shame because they're really good. But on those shows, he had like spoof interviewees like Philomena Kunk, who have now gone on to have their own programme here. So you've got Philomena and one or two others from Charlie Brooker's show and new ones too. Basically just looking back over the year and commenting on it, you know, making misinterpretations and all this kind of thing. And it has quite a well-knowing dig at social media as well and the kind of the way that people misinterpret things or get hung up about certain things when they shouldn't. So that was very funny. That was very good. And there's also A Year in the Life of a Year, which is another parody review, and this time hosted by Reese Thomas. And rather than having interviewees, this time it's all about mashups of clips. So clips from different TV shows and news footage and things like that are all edited in different ways to kind of present them in a very different context. So that was quite fun. And The Last Leg had a Christmas special and a New Year's special as well, of course, so I enjoyed watching both of those. In the New Year's special in particular, we had Alex Brooker driving a Formula 4 car at high speed around Donington Park, which he enjoyed. And we had Alex Horn with the horn section performing some funny songs, including one about peas that I thought was quite clever. There's also Have I Got News For You, of course. Charlie Brooker presented an episode of that, in fact. And blind comedian Chris McCausland had appeared in an earlier episode as a guest. 
And then What the Week had a couple of specials as well. One compilation to mark the end of the series, looking back at the different episodes, and one to celebrate Christmas and look back at the year in general. They both featured unseen material and outtakes as usual. Rhody Jones, who is a disabled comedian, she was on there as one of the guests at one point. And then moving on from that into other comedy game shows, um, we had 8 out of 10 Cats Does Countdown. They had a Christmas special on, including Bob Mortimer, who's always good for a laugh, and Lucy Beaumont, who is John Richardson's wife, was also on there. And then we had a few extended editions of QI as well over December, which was quite a surprise because the BBC have a knack of whipping them off the schedules for no good reason at the moment. So it's great that we've actually had a few of them in a row, including the Christmas special. My Virgin Media box always picks them up anyway, so I always know when they're on. But it's just frustrating that they're not shown in parallel with the main series, you know, the main shorter half-hour episodes. And then in relation to that, I also bought the Audiobook of the Year 2019 by the No Such Thing as a Fish team, they're a group of researchers who work on QI. They're some of the QI elves, as they're called. And each week they do a podcast about the facts they've discovered during that week. And so now for the past few years, they've done a book about the facts they've discovered during the year that are their favourites. And this is the third time they've done it. And yeah, it's just like an extended podcast, basically. They have lots of banter and chat and laughs and things like that. And it's just really nice to listen to. And there's a printed book version of it as well, which is what the audiobook is based on. So it's a really nice book to listen to. It's really interesting and very funny too. We also had the Big Fat Quiz of the Year and the Big Fat Quiz of the Decade on Channel 4, which was very funny, hosted by Jimmy Carr as usual. We had guests like Richard Iwadi, Noel Fielding, Dara O'Brien, Nish Kumar, etc. So that was good fun. And talking of Richard Iwadi, he hosted a Christmas special with the Crystal Maids because he's been hosting that series for a while now. I don't watch many of the episodes, but I saw the Christmas special to see Nish Kumar, who was one of the contestants that I was a fan of, and Richard Wilson had a cameo in it too. Um, the rest of the contestants I wasn't too interested in, but it was still fun. It was still a good show. And then Would I Lie to You was also back because that got moved off the schedules to make way for election debates and things. So it's nice to see that back. Bob Mortimer was in one of the episodes again. He's always very good on that show because his stories are very surreal and funny, even the true ones. And then the Christmas special, Stephen Merchant was the uh, best person there. And then in terms of other comedy, I bought Tim Vine's new live DVD, Sunset Milk Idiot, back in November, but I watched it over Christmas. And that's very funny as usual. Lots of clever puns and silly songs and silly props and so on. There's an interesting audio commentary he gives there, and there's a few other little bits and pieces among the extras that are worth looking at too. I also enjoyed listening to the Christmas special of his chat show on Radio 4, which I don't always listen to very often, but it was a very funny show. He you know, gets members of the audience to come out and chat to them and does lots of silly jokes again as well. And he's still got his Tim Vine Televisual TV TV channel on YouTube going as well, where he just uploads a new episode every week for a year, just one or two minutes long, with just silly little videos, but they're kind of fun. And then I also saw Dara O'Brien's stand-up show Voice of Reason from this year, which was shown on BBC Two. Usually on like DVDs, shows get edited down, but they're still retained as one cohesive performance, so you don't really notice where the cuts are. But here it was edited in such a way that you did know where the cuts were. You, there were very distinct routines picked out, and Dara O'Brien kind of spoke at the beginning about the bits that hadn't been included. So it felt a bit choppily edited, it didn't really flow quite as well, but it was still funny to watch, so I enjoyed that. And then Channel 5 showed a programme called The Two Ronnies, The Unseen Sketches. And this is about shows that The Two Ronnies made in Australia shortly before Ronnie Barker's retirement. And those sketches from those shows have never been seen in the UK in full before. Some of them are adaptations of sketches they did for the UK show. One or two of them are new. So yeah, it was really interesting to watch that. It was really fun. And then I also saw the Jonathan Ross show over Christmas as well, which I don't normally look at because the guests don't interest me. But I saw the Christmas special because they had a comedian called Beck Hill on there, who I've been following online for a while. And I've seen her live too at an evening of unnecessary detail in both 2018 and 2019. And one of the great things she does is she builds these creative flip charts using kind of artistic imagery and moving parts and things to represent misheard song lyrics. So she did a routine here about Christmas songs, incorporating guests from the show as well, like David Tennant, which is really clever. So that was really fun to watch. She was very clever with that. I also saw a live show by Joe Lysett on Channel 4 over Christmas. I've never seen one of his stand-up gigs before, so I thought I'd give it a go. And it was good. You know, I wouldn't buy it on DVD or anything, but it was a fun way to kill an hour because he's great at poking fun at businesses and trolling them on social media and online, things like that. And I also saw Live the Apollo as well over Christmas. They had a Christmas special. In particular, they had blind comedian Chris McCausland on there, which was fantastic. And Sarah Pascoe was great as the host too. There was also a duo called Flo and Joan on there who I wasn't so bothered by, but they seemed to do well, which was great. 
And then I also saw Michael McIntyre's Big Show, which had a couple of kind of festive-related editions. Um, one was a regular edition just before Christmas, but had a Christmas segment because they had Robbie Williams singing Christmas songs and a karaoke segment of it. And then we had the proper Christmas special. The best surprises were for the audience, of course. So one lady in particular got to meet her son who had moved to New Zealand and raised a family there, and she'd not seen him for a long time ever since. So Michael pretended to get them on FaceTime and then revealed them as being on stage. I mean, it's obvious to those of us watching at home what was about to happen because Michael never chooses any for no reason but it was still a huge surprise for the lady and it was great you know to see her family reunited like that so then moving on to drama and the first thing is something that i've kind of had some involvement with in terms of consultation uh, because it's been in development for a little while it actually came out in november but i was only made aware of it in december it's basically called how to be human it's a short sci-fi film set in a world where artificial intelligence has taken over and the only way for humans to live and survive is to make the dangerous crossing to a place called cold city You've got to hide your emotions and humanity as best you can so you know the artificial intelligence doesn't see you as being human because they might try and kill you or whatever. So it's pretty good and there's no violence or gore in there. You know, it's all about the tension. That's what's the important thing about it. It's a very immersive piece. It's quite fascinating to watch. and does make you think. The reason I was involved is because they did an audio described version as well. So I have been involved in kind of looking at early versions and giving my feedback on it as they tried different things. And I'm very happy with how that audio described version has come out. So I'll put a link to the YouTube video in the description, of course. And thank you to Cesar Portillo for inviting me to give feedback as they went along with the production of the film. I think that's come out really nicely. And then moving back to TV again, and one of the things I enjoyed was Wurzel Gummidge. Now, I've never read the books or seen the old TV series starring John Pertwee, so I had no frame of reference to compare this to. But I enjoyed it. You know, it's written and directed by Mackenzie Crook, who also plays Wurzel Gummidge, the scarecrow himself. And he's befriended by two visiting children, and they become friends. And both the episodes are very sweet, very nice. There's a lot of good humour in there. The visuals are beautiful. There's some lovely music in there too. And just everyone's great in it. And Michael Palin was in the second episode as well, which was nice. There are no confirmed plans for more episodes, but given that it had quite a good reaction, I'm sure the BBC will want to produce more if they can. So I wouldn't be at all surprised if we saw more of those. And then in terms of movies, I decided to try the two Paddington films. I think partially inspired by the fact that I've been writing about my favourite childhood TV shows in my blog over Christmas. There are three posts there you might want to check out. I'll link them in the description. One of them being Paddington, because I love the original TV show. They're really good family films. The CGI on Paddington is brilliant. The voice acting on Paddington by Ben Whishaw is also fantastic. There's a lot of other big names in there as well. You know, Hugh Bonneville, Sally Hawkins, Judy Waters, Jim Broadbent, Peter Capaldi, and so on and so forth. It's just really funny and really you know, emotional at times as well. You know, you do feel very sorry for Paddington sometimes when he's in trouble or in danger or he's a bit lost or whatever. So I really enjoyed those. And then the other film I thought I'd try out was the 2003 American comedy called Elf, because that seems to be on lots of people's Christmas list as one of their favourite Christmas films. And it's all right. It was quite good fun. It's a bit like Paddington in as much as it's about a fish out of water story of someone who's trying to adjust to life in the human race and how it all works. The difference here is that the person is actually human, but they were brought up believing they were an elf because they got brought up by Santa and his elves from when they were a baby. So they had to come to terms with the fact they were human and try and find their real father and all this kind of thing. And it's very sweet, it's very funny, you know, there's lots of funny moments in it. I wouldn't say it's one of my favourite Christmas films, you know, it's, it's certainly beaten by Home Alone and It's a Wonderful Life and Die Hard, which, yes, I do count as a Christmas film. But even so, Elf is still a pretty good film. It's not one I would buy, but I am glad I saw it at last. And in terms of music programmes, on the radio, Mum and I heard Junior Choice again this year, as is traditional. Annika Rice now presents that show where they play music from the old days, like Ernie, The Fastest Milkman in the West, and Three Wheels on My Wagon, Right Said Fred, things like that. There's a bit too much chatter in there. You know, we were able to skip through a lot of that on the iPlayer, thankfully. But the music is always very good. And then also on Radio 2, we had a programme presented by Matt Lucas where he played TV themes for three hours. We sound really dull, but if you're like me and you like your TV themes, there's a lot of classic tunes out there. I mean, just in the first hour, he played the theme tune from Minder, you know, I Could Be So Good For You by Dennis Waterman, the theme tunes to Fraggle Rock and Grandstand and The A-Team, and we had all sorts of others. It was very, very popular on social media as well. And he also interviewed composer David Lowe, who composed the now iconic theme tune for the BBC News and also composed the theme tune for The One Show and has done other bits and pieces too. And Matt also ran a quiz as well with a few callers to see how many theme tunes they could identify. I played along at home and you know, managed to get a fair number right. So overall, yeah, it was a really fun show. I enjoyed that. It was something a bit different for Christmas and we got to hear lots of tunes on the radio that you would never normally hear otherwise. And then on TV, I saw something called Smashy's Xmas-tastic playlist on gold, which is basically Paul Whitehouse resurrecting his comedy DJ character Mike Smash 
he did a two-part show playing various different Christmas music videos, not in their entirety. He'd either cut them off short or talk over them or whatever. But you got to see the majority of the songs in each case. And you would get like comedy factoids underneath as well. A bit like you get on shows like Top of the Pops 2 or something like that. But these were just all false parody factoids, basically. So it was a fun show. You know, It's not something I'd watch again, necessarily. But it was a fun little distraction over Christmas. And then I also downloaded various bits of music during the month as well. So I got the soundtrack to the Only Fools and Horses musical, which I really enjoyed earlier in the year. So I'm glad they've released the music to that. There's great original songs on there like Bit of a Store, Where Have All the Cockneys Gone, The Girl and the Tadpole Song. And they've done a great version of the theme tune as well, of course. So it's a really good soundtrack to listen to. There's also a new song released by Susie Quattro in December, which was a nice surprise. She had a new album out earlier in the year called No Control, and now this new song is called Heart on the Line. It's a very lovely song, so I can recommend that if you're a fan of hers. I also bought the deluxe edition of the new album by The Who, which is simply called Who. I got the deluxe edition because there was a few additional tracks on there. And it's a good album, you know, it's not quite as great as, you know, the stuff in their early days, but it's still, you know, typical Who, it's still got that great sound to it, so it's well worth buying if you're a fan of the band for your collection. Quite by chance, I also noticed that Brian Adams had released a Christmas EP with five tracks on there, including Joe and Mary, Must Be Santa and Christmas Time. So I downloaded that and that was really good to listen to. And then on a slightly nerdy note, perhaps I bought All the Stations Extras by Stephen Francis on his Bandcamp page. I've mentioned All the Stations before. It's the huge documentary project by Jeff Marshall and Vicky Pipe, where they travelled through all the stations on the UK Railway Network in 2017, and they went through all the stations on the Ireland Network in 2019. Stephen Francis wrote the theme music for All the Stations and various other music that was used throughout the series. And now he's released a bunch of extra tracks that was used that were never previously released. So I quite enjoy listening to them. If you're a fan of All the Stations and you want the music, then check out his Bandcamp page for these extra tracks because I think they're only there for a limited time. And then lastly, but by no means least, we can't get away from the festive season without mentioning the Christmas number one. Last year, it was We Built This City on Sausage Rolls by some YouTubers called Lad Baby, and now they've done it again. It's called I Love Sausage Rolls this year. It's a very catchy take on the hit by the Arrows, I Love Rock and Roll. They've also done a swing version as well, so there's two copies you can buy. And by getting to number one, they've actually got into the record books, because only the Beatles and the Spice Girls have ever had consecutive Christmas number ones before. So well done to them for that, especially because it's for charity. You know, it's not just a silly song for fun. Yeah, you know, There are much better Christmas songs out there, of course. But it's raising money for the Trussell Trust, who run food banks used by adults and children across the UK, because so many people are still in poverty. So it's great that you know this is raising awareness of that fact and they've been able to raise a lot of money again this year. And that's it. That's the end of my bumper Christmas favourites for 2019. I hope you made it all the way through that and enjoyed it if you did. Overall, 2019 was a very successful year and that was a nice end to it. You know, yes, there was a big dip in the middle with various things that were going on, but all the issues that came up over the summer have all been resolved for the better in one way or another. So I can look back on the year very positively overall because there were various exciting opportunities and surprises along the way as well. You know, I made my first ever appearance on TV and on British radio and I had my first ever documentaries made about me. I gave another public speech. I went to Liverpool for the first time. I went to various theatre shows and museum exhibitions and took part in various research projects and went to meet many people at socialising events. It was a very happy year. Now 2020 feels like I've hit the reset button a bit because of the various things that went on. I've got some nice plans coming up already for the year in the calendar and there'll be various other surprises that crop up I am sure. Thank you for all the support you've given me as always during the past year as in all previous years as well. So let's face 2020 together and see what it brings and I hope you'll continue to follow my adventures and support me along the way. Way. so thank you very much for watching this video and all my others and yeah i will see you for more videos in the year ahead bye for now
Thank you very much. Merry Christmas, everyone.